having me on here. Great to talk space uh, from the business and investing angle here. Uh, the Blue Origin launch was significant in a number of ways. First and foremost, it was Blue Origin's second crewed space flight. So uh, this is the second time they've been able to send humans up to and just past the edge of space, which underneath the U.S. definition is uh, at about uh, 80 kilometers altitude or in, in uh, U.S. metrics, that's uh, 50 miles of altitude. That gives you a couple of minutes of microgravity. Now, importantly, their first launch with people was also just three months ago. So this is also important because it's showing the company is able to quickly and uh, turn around the rocket and capsule and get the next one up and ready. So that's very important to the company's uh, plans and, and, and aspirations to launch people with more regularity as there are only four people on each capsule. So if they want to be uh, launching you know hundreds or even thousands of people you need to be able to launch in days and weeks rather than in months or years so that's that's important as well the the final piece that's important with this launch is like you already mentioned william shatner who's famous for playing uh, uh captain kirk in the original star trek series also flew on board this mission and not only you know himself as a legendary actor who's really famous for a role that inspired many people who i've spoken to in the space world to actually pursue their dreams in the in the industry but also at 90 years old became the oldest person who's flown to space and back and i'd say that uh, if you haven't already you should really go listen to, it's about maybe six or seven minutes long, uh, William Shatner talking to Jeff Bezos just after getting outside of the capsule. I mean, moments after stepping out of the spacecraft, he talks at length about the experience, you know, how it changed him. He's very emotional. He really describes in detail what it's like uh, in a way, in a, a very candid way that we haven't really seen yet uh, from a variety of people who have flown on the, the Blue Origin spacecraft to date. So you can kind of see all the different milestones that were involved in today's launch. Yeah, I thought it was really cool hearing him describe his experience um, in space to Jeff Bezos. So definitely check that out if you're listening. Um, so yeah, are we going to start seeing more celebrities go to space? Yes, absolutely. We're going to see more celebrities. Uh, I'd say for a couple of reasons. One uh, is that it's getting safer space flight and it's getting less expensive. Now, it's, it getting less expensive does not necessarily mean that, you know, your everyday folks like myself uh, can go out and afford it and buy a space flight like you can maybe an airline ticket, but uh, it is becoming less pricey. And that means that uh, celebrities who are generally what uh, people in the industry call high net worth individuals can afford to purchase a ticket like this, or at least could you know afford to get it financed through a movie or a documentary or something like that. Uh, there's a, also a kind of win-win situation here, as we saw with Blue Origin and William Shatner, where it's good PR for both the person and the company, uh, and that helps the company's you know uh, interests as a private organization and maybe you know more trying to help boost their public image overall. I, I'll highlight specifically that NASA has already confirmed that they've been working with uh, actor Tom Cruise on filming a, bo a movie aboard the International Space Station. And the Russians just sent uh, an actor and a director and producer to the International Space Station for a few days to film a movie there as well. So there's, as the private side of the industry is adding capacity and adding more capability to deliver people to uh, the orbit, to the edge of space, to the International Space Station, more and more people are looking for these opportunities and, and it's kind of becoming the broad, kind of feeding the broader commercial market there. So you said that it's becoming a little bit less expensive to go to space, but it's still pretty expensive, I would think. So um, how much does a ticket uh, cost to go to space? So the ballpark is pretty wide. Uh, it starts at about maybe $200,000 is the uh, cheapest that people have paid historically for a Virgin Galactic ticket. And it ranges all the way up to, you know, ballpark, say $200 million, which is what you would likely have to pay to book a, you know, SpaceX Crew Dragon flight for yourself for multiple, you know, weeks or even months in space. Uh, a lot of this is... Uh, comes with some ambiguity. We don't know, uh, aside from Virgin Galactic, exactly how much SpaceX 
and Blue Origin are tri- charging their private astronauts for missions. Uh, SpaceX already flew the Inspiration 4 mission to orbit for three days. Uh, or uh, Last month, uh, Blue Origin and Jeff Bezos has said that they've sold up to $100 million worth of tickets. Now, that could be 10 people paying $10 million each, or that could be 100 people each paying a $1 million. We don't know. Uh, but the, the general uh, price range right now is in the couple hundred thousand to multiple millions range. Good to know. Um, so you recently talked to Inspiration4 Commander Jared Isaacman. Um, what did he tell you about his experience going to space? We actually had a really in-depth uh, Q&A interview where he talked at length about a variety of aspects of the mission. So I, I highly recommend you go read that, check it out. Uh, it's very insightful. And I've gotten a lot of reader feedback saying, you know, this is some of the most candid uh, items they've read from an astronaut on their time in space, and especially from someone who's flown on SpaceX's Crew Dragon uh, spacecraft. Additionally, uh, you know, in our conversation, Jared talked a lot about the launch and reentry experience. During launch, he described uh, being inside of Crew Dragon as being able to hear everything, the rumble of propellant loading into the rocket, the sensation of liftoff, the feeling of weightlessness as soon as you get into orbit. And then during reentry, he's, you know, really emphasized how intense that whole, you know, about 70 to 80 minute process was where people came, they where they came back down to earth. He described the force uh, as they were coming back through the atmosphere as like an elephant sitting on their chests. And when they hit uh, the water, because they splashed down in the ocean, like getting rear-ended in a car from behind. So some pretty intense uh, descriptions, some very vivid understandings of what it's like to fly in SpaceX's capsule and giving a better idea of, of what this whole idea of being someone who's a spacefarer, someone who's an astronaut, especially from a non-professional standpoint, you know, Jared Isaacman and his crew only started training less than six months ago for their space flight. These guys are not professional, fully trained government astronauts. Uh, and so there's a kind of a, an interesting perspective in there about what it's like to experience space flight. Yeah, I would definitely encourage everyone to head over to cnbc.com and check that out. Great read. Um, So let's stick with SpaceX. Um, It just hit a $100 billion valuation. So what's next for the company? So they've got a variety of things going on. And uh, the $100 billion valuation notably came without the usual capital raise that they've been doing over the last few years. So this was a secondary share offering to company insiders uh, that just bumped up the valuation internally effectively. Uh, Because they're a private company, you have to really try to sort through the details here. But um, the milestones that are upcoming for SpaceX are a couple. First and foremost, with their Starlink project, which is probably uh, their most profitable uh, project that they're working on in in terms of long term revenue. Uh, That is going to be going operational soon. They've been in a public beta now for several months. And now uh, Elon Musk is saying that Starlink is going to go fully operational. Uh, That'll be a, a, a big leap into commercial service. The other milestone to look for coming up uh, in the next few months is going to be the Starship orbital test flight. SpaceX has been testing this really massive uh, next generation rocket for for several months. They've flown multiple short test flights, uh, but now they're going to really take that next step and jump in into orbit. And that's that's going to be coming up. And then the other big one that you should pay attention to is the next big private astronaut mission for SpaceX. That's the Axiom AX-1 mission, uh, which uh, worthwhile noting that Axiom is uh, the one managing and operating the mission, whereas SpaceX is the one providing the rocket and the capsule for the mission. That's going to spend 10 days at the International Space Station and send four uh, private astronauts up there. So those are the three big things I'd say you should be looking out for from SpaceX in in the next few months. And do you have any idea on timing of a SpaceX IPO? So this has been a hot topic for a long time because it's such a vague um, you know, concept and, and there's not been a really clear sense of when that would truly happen. Uh, Musk has only really said, and, and other company leadership has said that it'll happen when uh, SpaceX is regularly flying trips to and from Mars. Now, how regular, what that looks like, uh, whether it's after the first 
two or after the first 20, it, it's not very clear. And that, that would may put it, you know, several years up at least. Um, another key aspect underneath this is that he has talked a bit about uh, spinning off Starlink, the satellite internet project as a separate and, and company and, and taking that company public. What that would look like, uh, you know, is up for debate. We don't know a lot there. Uh, we only know that, you know, he's not, uh, Musk is not really willing to, to take Starlink uh, public until they're not re- earning a huge loss every year. So they kind of have to get through this period of, of development and early stage uh, uh, capitalization first before they can get to a point where that company would go public. All right, so switching topics here a little bit, um, when will widespread commercial space stations take off? So that's a great topic, and it's going to be very interesting because the International Space Station is uh, only projected to last maybe another few years here. There's been a couple issues with leaking. Uh, It's been in orbit for 20 years. It's um, one of the most expensive research laboratories ever created. It's also proven to be uh, incredibly valuable to the world beyond just NASA and the Russians and other space agencies, uh, given the technologies that have been tested there. But private commercial space stations is going to be a very interesting topic over the next decade. And I would say that at earliest, we're talking about very late in the 2020s, probably like 2028, 2029, 2030, maybe, uh, when space stations are beginning to be more widely available. There's a couple of different companies that are working on these projects uh, for a variety of use cases, uh, everything from tourism, and you're talking like a, a hotel in orbit, to more research laboratories, to manufacturing facilities and beyond. So uh, that's going to be really you know, developing in these next few years, we're going to see more projects coming online. Uh, NASA is already working with a couple different companies on projects. Um, Axiom, a company I mentioned earlier, has a contract with NASA to build a module that's going to attach to the International Space Station, and then with the plan to later detach it as a free-flying space station later. And NASA has other projects in the works with as many as a dozen companies interested in uh, investing their own money alongside of NASA and building space stations in orbit. So uh, this is something that's going to take several more years at least uh, to come online. But uh, there is a huge push to make it happen because the International Space Station lifespan is coming to a close. So we had a question come in about spacesuits. Um, who might be some of the front runners for NASA's new commercial spacesuit contract? So um, SpaceX has already effectively been offered as a, a contractor underneath a private space suit uh, for NASA. Elon Musk effectively said, hey, look, we could do this uh, after a report said that the ones that have been in development for almost two decades that are running in a billion dollars in development costs. So they're a front runner. Boeing has been working on a flight suit for their Starliner spacecraft. Now that would take some serious beefing up to take what's effectively a, a flight pressurization suit and make it uh, capable of being in space and surviving and on what uh, astronauts call an EVA, extravehicular activity. Uh, you also have a couple other companies out there on, and one I'd mention that I could see bidding for a spacesuit contract would be Sierra Nevada Corporation with their subsidiary, so Sierra Space. They're kind of a uh, aerospace and, and space contractor. Uh, they've had a, a number of recent success in there, and so they've been really, um, you know, building up their repertoire of different offerings, including a, a private space station offering. So a spacesuit would be kind of a natural evolution of, of what they've already been working on. And our last question, um, how can people invest in the space industry? So increasingly, there are more ways to play the space industry from an investor perspective. Uh, There's because of this SPAC boom uh, in the last year or so, a number of space companies have taken that route as a means to raise capital and then have gone public as a result of it. So by the end of uh, 2021, we're actually expected to have a dozen more space companies that are publicly traded than were in the marketplace before the year began, which is a a huge jump forward. Um, I get, I name a couple of different items underneath here. I could have had a a number that I follow closely here. When you look at propulsion and infrastructure, you've got Aerojet Rocketdyne and uh, Redwire Space. We talk about satellites and 
uh, imagery and, and data analysis. You've got Iridium Communications, Maxar, Viasat, Black Sky, Spire Global, and, and soon to be Planet going public. Uh, when you want to talk about rockets in a similar vein as SpaceX, you've got Rocket Lab, Astra. We're soon to, expecting to have Virgin Orbit also going public. And then you even have a broader way to play the space industry in terms of in, from as, a, as an investor, and that'd be through an ETF, which is more broadly diversified. Um, you can either play through the ARK Invest, uh, ARK X Space Exploration ETF, or the UFO ETF. And, and those each have very different characteristics. The uh, ARK Invest one's an actively managed ETF trades more companies that have like secondary involvement to the space world rather than are, are primarily deriving their revenue from uh, hardware and, and spacecraft and things like that in the industry. Whereas UFO has a, a number of other companies that are directly playing in the space industry. Uh, and so there's a little bit of a different way you can think about approaching it. But uh, the the thing I would leave folks with is uh, there's these companies in the space industry have a, a wide variety of uh, success, a wide variety of uh, whether or not they have significant revenue or not, whether or not they have significant profitability or not. So not every space company is made the same and uh, really would emphasize the fact that you really have to look underneath the hood and understand um, where this company's uh, future profits and future potential comes from. Well, this is definitely an interesting topic to watch. Um, thank you so much for joining us and all of our questions. Um, thank you so much to everyone for tuning in. Bye. Thank you.